Great. Um, yeah, so, so KS Irving is, is built to address the, the deployment aspect of the model serving or of the, the model lifecycle problem. Um, we expect customers to come with us with pre-trained models where we want to integrate really well with those systems, but we're not interested in, in any of the of, of trying to solve the, the training or hyperparameter tuning problems. Um, and there are a lot of problems in the serving space. Some of the kind of the first most obvious ones that exist for all serving use cases are, are cost and monitoring. We want to make sure that we're not wasting any resources and we want to make sure that we have deep insight into what our endpoints are, whether or not they're happy. Um, and this includes things like distributed tracing and, and metrics and dashboards. Um, we want to be able to enable production workloads with safe rollouts. Um, a lot of users or a lot of, a lot of companies are familiar with the canary strategy where you slowly release a product or an update to a product um, to a small percentage of your users and you slowly uh, increase that percentage until you have a complete rollout. And so we have first, first class support for, for canary rollouts. Um, protocols are also kind of an interesting piece of, of serving right now. It's pretty fragmented across all the different serving frameworks, TensorFlow Serving, TensorRT, Selden. Um, they all have different ways to, to make a prediction request. And we want to uh, well document that for all serving frameworks and potentially eventually come up with some sort of unified framework if, if we can find a way to do that. And until then, we want to find recommended uh, protocols for how to communicate with different types of models. Um, and on top of that, we want to provide a really awesome experience for how to use different frameworks like XGBoost, Scikit-Learn, uh, and TensorFlow. Um, we want to enable flexibility to have users bring their own container to run whatever code, and so long as they conform to the ecosystem that we've created, it'll integrate well with all of our systems. Um, and those systems include things like uh, support for explainers, outlier detection, skew detection, um, pre- and post-processors, all of these things. We've, we've heard lots of requests from customers of what goes on in a, in a serving microservices graph. Um, Knative is one of our, our core dependencies. It doesn't leak through our interface, but it's pretty core to our strategy. Um, Knative is an awesome project by Google. It's been out for about a year and a half now, and it's all about bringing um, container-based serverless workloads on Kubernetes. Um, the, I really like this image up here. It's just kind of a, a great visualization of what serverless buys you. Um, and at a, at a high level, it's just where, where traditional uh, provisioning gives you these huge breakpoints of cost. Serverless allows you to scale kind of all of the scale really smoothly with your workloads. And that includes scaling down to zero, uh, which we've enabled for KF serving. And uh, Istio is another uh, really awesome platform, open source project uh, with a whole bunch of contributors from, the, from various companies. And we're using this as well for kind of our, our, our compute fabric. And together, they give us this really awesome serving platform. They, they solve a huge amount of common serving problems that we can then specialize with ML-specific opinions and ML-specific features. Um, so we're not, we're not worrying about writing autoscalers. We're not worrying about writing the, the traffic splitters, but we integrate really well with them, which gives us this, uh, this paradigm where KF serving is um, it's a, it's a machine learning layer on top of Knative, Istio, Kubernetes, and then whatever cloud you're, uh, you're running on, or even on-prem. This is somewhat of a, a difficult slide to parse, I think, if you're unfamiliar with the project, but this is how we've been thinking about what KF Serving is from the development perspective. Um, if you start at the top, that's where the user is. The user is sending prediction requests. Um, and you have some sort of load balancer that's going into your cluster. Maybe you're running in cluster and you have an internal load balancer or external and you're going through some sort of gateway. Um, and then you land into the Istio Knative ecosystem, which is handling, kind of getting you onto their, uh, onto their fabrics. Um, and our, the first thing we do is, is split traffic based off of a customer traffic split decision. So in your, in your resource, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, you can, you can elect to have a per percentage of your traffic sent somewhere, and you get two configurations, uh, you know, fully distinct configurations that allow you to make these smooth rollouts. Um, 
the orchestrator component is basically just a, we, we've been calling it the executor actually, um, but it's, it's a way of, of making requests throughout the entire graph and all the graph components you can see in there. Um, and examples of these would be the outlier detector or the explainer or a pre and post processor, but all of these are completely optional. If the user wants to provide any of them, we'll wire it up through the orchestrator. And if they just provide a predictor, then we'll just have the predictor. Um, so this is what our resource looks like. The, the most minimal one is pretty simple. The, there's a little bit of Kubernetes boilerplate, which is necessary. Some people complain about it. I, I think it's elegant. Um, and then our spec is, is really just, you can see there's a, a default configuration. We're not providing a canary. And we've elected to choose the, the TensorFlow option. And within that, we point to the only required field is a model URI. We're hosting this out of GCS. That model happens to be public, so there's no real auth necessary to wire up. Um, and if, you're, if your cloud, you know, by default has access um, via auth scopes or, or whatever mechanism you're, you're using potentially on-prem, you just have open permissions. Um, but you, you, you get, uh, we'll, we'll just download straight from whatever that path is. XGBoost is, is just the same. The, the only difference here is that you're selecting XGBoost instead of TensorFlow, but uh, the, the customization parameters of XGBoost and TensorFlow will differ. So um, you might see slightly different ones in there depending on what type of parameters you're passing in. Um, and this might be like, for example, for TensorFlow, this might be the session parallelism, or you might be passing in the batch size. Uh, and scikit-learn is the same story. Um, we've also allowed custom containers where we, we take a custom spec, allows you to specify the environment variables, the arguments, you can run whatever you want. Um, this is a great way to enable Selden use cases, or, or a lot of the use cases that Selden is supporting. Um, and so uh, you basically have full access to the container spec there. We've talked a little bit about making it the pod spec, and this is something that the, the Knative team themselves are doing for their resources, kind of opening up the permissions here, but we want to be careful that we're not providing so much control that it undermines the, the value of the product. Um, and then GPUs, of course, is one of the core machine learning uh, pieces. And it's, you know, like you can see, you can see that we just accept a, a Kubernetes standard resource requests um, spec. And so you can pass in GPUs like that. And of course, the canary thing we've been talking about, um, you can uh, specify canary traffic percent and specify all the components under that canary uh, under that canary key, and you can see here we have 10% of traffic going to flowers two, and 90% of traffic going to flowers. Um, there's a little example of our of our kubectl get command. Um, so we give you the URL that you're running on, as well as the the traffic split. And that's where we're at right now. We have a pretty big vision for what we want the product to be. There's a huge amount of things in scope. Um, right now, we're just trying to nail down the core use cases, make sure auto scaling is great, make sure the GPU experience is great, make sure the, the framework experience is great. But there's all sorts of things we want to attack, like you know, GPU sharing for performance and, um, and payload logging, get that, get that story really strong. Um, there's some work with explainability going on. Um, but that's mostly, that's where we're at. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Uh, I had a question. Uh, are things like, uh, for example, when serving a model, any data transformations or batching, are those handled in the preprocessor module that you showed, or or is it part of the framework? Uh, yeah, so so there's a lot of different use cases for preprocessing. Um, sometimes users may do it expressly within their model, especially if you have a custom um, a custom container spec. But if, uh, if, for example, you're using a TensorFlow graph and you need to, say, read from some feature store um, to translate some input, you would definitely absolutely do that in the, um, in the preprocessor component. Uh, how about things like batching? Would the framework provide that? or What do you mean by, you mean like a batch it, prediction batch. use case or just request batching for performance? Re request batching for performance. Yeah, so that's the kind of thing that we want to open up to allow users to configure via the, the specs. So, um, for example, TensorFlow has a, a request batch size uh, parameter, um, and we'd like to you know, allow users access to that. Okay. 
I just realized, Animesh, we didn't um, add anything about eventing on these slides. Probably be worthwhile to. Uh, I won't go too deep into it right now, but we we it's kind of relates to your batch size question of we'd like to at some point enable the the pub sub use case. Yeah, yeah, no, we should we should extend this. I think definitely you know this is the as we are calling it one on one version. Now you know subsequent to this you know we will be creating you know a little bit more detailed and going into you know the additional use cases. Yeah. Uh, and for authentication, are you guys using the Kubeflow authentication model? So Kubeflow, I believe, uses Istio, um, as well as I guess it's it's changed. I'm not up to date on what the most modern version is, um, but the user has full control over uh, their Istio policies, and so that allows you to just slot in whatever authentication you want because we're running the sidecar. Okay. Yeah, and currently, you know, uh, I think from that perspective, it is going to use, you know, as, as it gets integrated into the Qflow mainstream authentication and authorization mechanism, it definitely will use that, uh, you know, wherever uh, Qflow settles on right now. If you see, there is quite a bit of discussion uh, vis a vis, you know, the STO as the primary mechanism for authentication and authorization on the Qflow side. So I believe, you know, that will play nicely into this given that, you know, the use used to you as part of the stack as well. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, this is Jashin. I have a question. To, uh, for the um, uh, serialized model, as I understand, so right now we still use the, the native formats of different uh, frameworks. Uh, there is no unified uh, model for mass model, right? Yeah, that, that problem, you're talking about a, a unified serialized model for every framework. Yeah. Um, there's, I guess, uh, there are several projects that are trying to solve that. Uh, I know NVIDIA has like their, their TensorRT format and there's, there's Onyx as well. And um, that problem, I think, is probably outside of the scope of what we're trying to accomplish in Kubeflow. Obviously, we want to support as many of the formats as you know completely transparently whatever your format is we should be able to recognize it and then we should be able to load it um, and you'll see that right now if you try and run you know an xg boost model we'll, we'll use a dot bst or, or we'll use a bot or a, a job lib or a pickle um, but i think that problem that that particular unification problem is outside of the scope of what we're trying to attack right now but um yeah i mean never say never it would be pretty cool to to have some sort of you know, unified definition, but I think that's a, a pretty crazy problem, especially given the number of frameworks that exist. Yeah, I think that um, if I can just uh, weigh in a, a little bit here, um, uh, uh, I want to point at some work that uh, Animesh and IBM has contributed to a, a separate effort from this called uh, ML Spec, where we are trying to come up with um, a, a model packaging framework. I, I will say that exactly like Ellis said, um, I don't think that it would be great to have a single um, format for model package um, uh, that, that, that unified them all more than anything. I think that the thing that would be the strongest would be to have a kind of high level structure. And then inside that structure, you say, OK, this is a TensorFlow format. Now here's all the elements that are relevant to TensorFlow, rather than specifically trying to say, well, no, there's literally only going to be one a schema for describing your whatever hyperparameter settings or something like that as part of the, the model package. Does that make sense? Mm, yes. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, but uh, please do um, uh, you know reach out to Animesh or myself. Uh, th it is outside the scope of, of KF serving though. Though uh, in ML spec, we're uh, very interested and supportive of what um, Ellis is uh, and and others are doing, um, and and hope to um, have the two uh, services aligned over time. Yeah, and just another note on the standardization. We think about our responsibility of standardization on, on two axes. Um, if you're familiar with the, the terms control and data plane, uh, those are the two areas of, of standardization. So we've, we've pretty much achieved control plane standardization so far for KF serving. And that's not to say that all models are, descri are describable using our interface, but um, we, we'd like to achieve that. And so for every framework we've encountered so far, we have a, a clean way of describing them with this KF service document that we've defined. 
Um, so that's that's kind of the control plane problem. And the, the second problem is the data plane problem, which I touched on briefly. It's more challenging given how many existing protocols there are right now. Our policy is to support a small number of them. Um, and right now we, we just support like the, the TensorFlow serving protocol and the, um, the Selden protocol. But we're looking into supporting the TensorRT protocol as well. The, the problem is we don't want to have that expand too, to, be, to, to be too many because, you know, it's obviously a really confusing customer experience and you don't want to be at the point where you're, you know, have crazy bloat on this. So, and a lot of these things are, are kind of duplicated effort. They're, they're all really good attempts, but I don't think anyone has really nailed it yet. Um, so one of our longer term goals is to look at all these protocols and eventually say, you know, we've, we've looked at all these, we've seen all the use cases so far. Here's a proposal for a standardized data plane, use, you know, interface. And maybe that's going to be different for images versus tabular data or whatever. Um, but but that's that, that, that data plane standardization problem we'd like to eventually get to, at least in the context of KF serving. Yeah, sounds good. So one other question is there are several hardware accelerators coming up. So you guys are uh, either APIs will will handle some of those things or in a generic way. Some of them will take the whole model and put it into the hardware and those kind of things. I mean, what I'm saying is the compile of that can happen outside, but the load, the server should only handle load and run, right? Those kind of things. Yeah, we're really relying on the model serialization to to take advantage of this. Um, for say, for example, a TPU, um, they have to run in a different model server than a traditional TensorFlow TensorFlow serving model server for a TensorFlow graph, um, just because the the whole programming model is different. But uh, ideally, the the compatibility layer there would be the the serialized model. And you know, if you specify TPU, we'd be able to pick the right model server for for running. Um, on whatever hardware accelerator is necessary. And that, that's kind of guarded by the interface being generic, generic to just the a framework like TensorFlow rather than specific to something like TensorFlow serving. Got it. And then the, and then the, the way if you, if you want to incorporate a, a new hardware accelerator is via a custom definition. Is that what he's looking at? A custom server? Yeah, so it really depends on how your hardware accelerator will work. Uh -huh. um, but if, you know, if, for example, the only way to make that hardware accelerator work would be to have a custom server, um, okay. yeah, we'd, we'd need to be able to somehow signal that the user wants to use that <clears throat> custom accelerator, probably through a Kubernetes annotation, and then, you know, slot, slot in that, that particular image in that case. Okay. Cool. Uh, I think we should, it's 9.30, and in the interest of eventually getting to some of the topics we were trying to cover on Wednesday, um, is everyone kind of good to, to move forward? Are there any other high-level questions, or should we jump into some of the meat? And feel free to, to drop out if this is all you came for. All right. Uh, Clive, do you want to touch on the the executor orchestrator question? Uh, yeah, sure. So I'm not sure if you want to show the um, that diagram.